What we have happening here is really a story of renewal. The story up to this point in the book of Kings is of a litany of terrible kings, the worst kind of leaders you could imagine, who have been given this task to be a very different kind of people in the world, a people of God's holiness, his righteousness, his justice, but they continually fail at this task. One of the indicators of how well they're doing at this task is really how they worship. And they do worship God, the God of the Bible, Yahweh, but they also have a foot in both camps, worshiping other gods in other high places. And when we get to this point, what we have is this project of renewal that King Josiah has set about but there's some really key details we need to be aware of. He is giving money for a rebuilding of the dwelling place of God, where God's presence is to find its home, the temple. So the center of this story is creating a place where God can come and live with humans, as he did at the beginning of Scripture in the book of Genesis. But it's really interesting because... The king instructs those working for him to give them money for the building of the temple, the rebuilding, this work of renewal, not to the people you would think that he would give it to. You'd expect that the money would be passed to people who were religious figures, the spiritual people, what you would call in Australian slang, the super spiros. <laughs> now, this had happened about 10 chapters earlier when another king, a king Joash, had also tried to do a project of renewal. And he'd given money to the religious figures for the rebuilding of the temple, but actually nothing had happened. So what King Josiah does is something which blows some of the categories of our understanding is, who are the agents of renewal? And he gives it to tradesmen. Now, most of us, when we think about who are the most spiritual figures that we think about, we may think of a priest, the clergy, perhaps someone wandering through a forest somewhere, perhaps someone who is like us, but sort of above us, floating in the ether. What we don't think about when we think about people who are spiritual, whom the Spirit hovers over, are someone beside the road in high vis, perhaps with a jackhammer. Someone on a work site who has got an angle grinder, who is coming home covered in sawdust. But if we understand the scriptures, we actually realize that trades people actually have a really interesting part to play in the kingdom of God. In Exodus 33, the first people to have the Holy Spirit come upon them, since Adam and Eve walked in God's presence, was actually the trades people who were given the task of making the different things which would be part of the dwelling place of God. So pay attention to this. The kind of structures that we rebuild and the people who the Holy Spirit comes over in moments of renewal are different than what you think. And it undoes the categories. Pause that thought in your mind uh, I want to begin with a story. Now, in Australia, we have a domestic flight uh, which goes from Perth to Melbourne, and it's just quite right small. It's only about three and a half hours long. And it's the equivalent of flying from, Melbourne, uh, sorry, from London to about Moscow. This is an internal flight. You don't leave the country, uh, and, it, and it's, it's just mad. Now, I was doing this flight after speaking for a whole weekend with some churches in Perth. And this was just uh, not long after Australia was sort of getting on its feet again. And like many places around the world, because of COVID, there's lots of flight crews uh, under, understaffed because people have retired. And we had this, this plane, it was sitting on the tarmac, and you know when the flight crew finally gets on the plane and you can tell that they're flustered. Flight crews in Australia can do these crazy days where you might begin in Melbourne, fly to Sydney, you go to Darwin, you're in, you're in a jungle, like tropical zone, you can fly to Hobart, and then it's like you're near Antarctica, you can fly to Perth. It's just absolutely mad. This was near the end of their shift, and you could see they had just made it onto the plane. The plane was absolutely rammed with people, except for one seat just on my right across on the aisle. Now, they're about to close the flight doors when finally the empty seat passenger turns up and it's a lady walking down the aisle and sometimes people have an air about them 
and you can sort of see what's coming. This lady had an air about her, and I could see something was coming. I didn't know what it was, but I had a sense this was not going to be your ordinary flight. So I settle in, and uh, I was tired, and I'm ready just to, to sit back and not think and just zone out. Now, the flight crew announced, they said, look, sorry, we, we've come late, and there's actually a problem with the plane. The actual entertainment system is not working. I was relieved to hear that, because if you're told there's a problem with the plane, I just want it to be not an engine, uh, but the entertainment system not working. I'm sort of okay with that. This lady basically then pressed the button and called the flight crew to come. And she made it very clear in a very sort of angry tone. She wasn't raising her voice. She had that sort of precise intonation that happens from someone who is not used to losing their, their, anger, like their temper as much, but used to getting their way. And she told the flight crew that this was not acceptable, that, that this wasn't uh, working. And I thought, okay, just leave it, lady. And uh, she let it go after about 10 minutes of complaining to the flight crew. Now, what happened was, about another 15 minutes later, she decided to press the button again to call the flight crew back and again to express how unhappy she was. I'm like, really, just let it go, lady. This continued to happen for the entire flight every 15 minutes, and this woman continued to complain to the flight crew to the point where she escalated it and asked for the head of the flight crew. I did not realize that flight crews had heads, <laughs> but she met with her. And you could see that what was going on was this entire flight crew's now task was to keep this lady calm. We were about 45 minutes from Melbourne. This has been going on for some time. And she finally calls them in and says, listen, I've had enough. What I have realized and what I have experienced on this flight, that you are failing me. As a flight crew, you are failing me because you've got a job to do. Your job is to put me in a state of mind where I am relaxed in my mind and I'm having pleasurable experiences in my mind. And I'm thinking, no, your job, first of all, don't, let's, let's not crash. I'm happy with that. And if I get a biscuit and a cup of tea, I'm, I'm, I'm sorted, like that, that's happy. But this woman had elevated what she expected from this flight crew, and she wanted something that was actually quite stunning. Finally, we're about 15 minutes from Melbourne, just before that, you know, they sort of pack up the, the plane and prepare you for landing, and she brings them back one more time. And she says, I finally worked out what's going on. One of the stewardesses is not wearing a name badge. Now, I believe she has done this deliberately. And the reason she has done this is because she is targeting me, and the flight crew is targeting me, and I've been experiencing on this plane a conspiracy against me, and I am not happy, and we need to escalate this. And I'm just like, wow, okay, I've never seen this before. Now, what I realized was, for this woman, she was seeing things very differently. She was seeing this flight crew actually as this group of people who were there to serve her, and this entire scenario was not about the other passengers. It was not about us getting there safely. This was actually a platform for her to have her desires and this state of mind achieved. Now, I realized that I could, in a sense, look down on this woman, but actually, this woman was an extreme example, but there was something emblematic going on with her. You see, we have been shaped by a platform mentality in which we see what it is to be a human and to live a good life is when our individual desires are met and we receive validation by being affirmed and seen and even served by others. And this platform mentality is so part of this moment that we fail to see it. And what it does is it frames how we see institutions and communities of which we play a part, whether that be a school, a workplace, a flight from Perth to Melbourne. We have reframed and reimagined these things, which are always part of our lives, in a new way where they are platforms to serve us, to serve our needs. Now, the interesting thing was that we've reached this, and this flight showed this, this peak platform mentality precisely at the time 
when our world is starting to struggle to deliver that. The fact that the flight crew were undermanned, the fact that all kinds of things are happening in our world, supply chain disruptions, energy crisis, cost of living crisis is we've reached peak expectations of what we want from these things precisely as society's ability to deliver these things is actually decreasing. Now, as we came into Melbourne, over the PA, when we hit the tarmac, the flight announcement happens, which happens in most places, which, you know, welcome to Melbourne, the temperature is 17 degrees. But what happens in Australia is, because of our culture and the conversation that's in our culture, is that you also get what's known as a welcome to country. A welcome to country is an acknowledgement of the various different indigenous nations and tribes. So if you land in Sydney, you'll get a welcome to the Gadigal people, or if you land in Melbourne, it'd be the Kulin Nation, the Wurundjeri people, which is the land that I live on. And what they do in the welcome to country is they also say, we want to pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging. And it's quite interesting when people are visiting Australia and you hear a welcome to country, people are quite taken aback that you have this very public, and it'll happen at different community meetings, a welcome to the elders. And in Australian indigenous cultures, elders are really important. I want to give you a definition from a website of what is an elder in the Australian indigenous community. It says, elders are the spiritual and moral leaders of Aboriginal people and play a tremendous role in the community. Elders are those whose teaching of younger generations and who pass on stories and knowledge. Elders are individual, have a deep connection with their heritage and live their lives by example of traditional principles, morals, and teaching. An elder's central role is to instill Aboriginal teachings in the community. So we're landing, this woman's on my right, showing peak platform mentality. And as I heard the welcome to country, the acknowledgement of country as we landed, and this recognition of the importance of elders in Australian indigenous culture, I could not help but notice the contradiction that in my country, we pay this deep respect to elders and we value them and we have this conversation about how do we value them in indigenous culture. Yet the rest of the entire script, and I think it's not just my country, I think it's all across the developed world, is increasingly not about living a life where you're built into this kind of elder, all those values that I just read out, actually the life script that you're taught runs completely contrary to these things. So why do only some communities appreciate elders? And why does contemporary Western culture ignore them and lead us down a different path? Well, what's another word for being an elder? Elders are pillars. In this room, we see these structural elements of these pillars holding up and creating this space in which we can meet. And so an elder is a pillar, and a pillar is a person of wisdom, strength, reliability, and character whose personhood acts as a supportive structure for a community. This means a pillar is a role. And a pillar isn't just a role if you're not fulfilling that role. No one calls you a pillar of the community if you're doing everything to undermine that community. So a pillar is a role, but it's also an overflow of our character. And so interestingly, when you're a pillar, it actually creates space for other people to become pillars when your character flows into their lives and inspires them. You ready for this sentence? I made it up, I think it's good, it may not be, but I think it captures what I'm trying to get at. Pillars build pillars while being pillars. <laughs> Are you laughing because it's good or you think it's weird? <laughs> thank you, thank you, this, this part of the room likes it, that's great, over here they're not so sure. And what's interesting about being a pillar in Australian indigenous culture, a person doesn't just one day say, I'm going to be a pillar. There's a whole process of education and formation. You learn and you go on this task. That's why they say, we well, want to acknowledge the, the elders past, the ones who have lived and passed on, present, and the ones that are emerging. There's actually this process of formation. And you see, our society is made up of institutions and organizations. 
And what institutions are, and we're all part of them, whether you study, you're part of a community, one, a church is an institution. They're groups of people who come together to focus their efforts towards a goal of flourishing. And they do this by repeatedly doing actions which they believe will live out that vision that they're moving towards together. So this means when we join an institution and when we commit to it, we're also committing to the reality that that institution will shape us towards its goals. We join an institution knowing it's going to change us and form us towards its vision of what a flourishing world is. I think that's truest in the church. What we just saw, this this rite that we do, this, this, this baptism that we do is part of that change process that we engage in when we join the church. But in our time, because we're in a time of platform mentality, it means that institutions are being undermined. We see them differently. The American political scientist Yuval Levin says this. We've moved, roughly speaking, from thinking of institutions as molds that shape people's character and habits towards seeing them as platforms that allow people to display themselves before a wider world. And what I realize we've done is we've swapped out elders and pillars for celebrities and influences. Instead of building a life that's a pillar, we now just to seek a kind of lifestyle Now, we still want pillars. When we don't get what we want, we want to know there's someone in charge. We want to know that someone is creating a supportive structure for us. But the problem is, when you want pillars but don't want to become a pillar, what that does is it keeps you in a kind of continual childlike state of underdevelopment as a human and also spiritually. And like teenagers, we like living under the benefits of paternal care who are pillars, but we also like rebelling against the very pillars which support us at times. So we want pillars for support or blame. Now, I believe at this moment, we need to change our understanding of what it is to be a human being and what it is to live a life of flourishing. Now, if you read on in Kings and you go to the next chapter, in verses 1 to 3 of Kings 23, it says this. Then the king called together all of the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. What's happened in this building process, as they've worked on the building, the tradespeople have discovered that in a wall, hidden away, forgotten, is actually the word of God, the Torah. And they bring out the word of God, and the king rips his clothes in this act of mourning because they've forgotten the centrality of what God's called them to do. This is the thing that they're meant to shape themselves around. And the king brings that back to the center of the community. And so the king calls together all the elders. Notice the elders. He went up to the temple of the Lord with the people of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets, all of the people from the least to the greatest. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant which had been found in the temple of the Lord. The king stood by the pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord, keep his commands, statutes and decrees with all his heart and all his soul, thus confirming the words of the covenant written in this book. Then all the people pledged themselves to the covenant. In this season, and I believe the spiritual season we're in, is actually one of rebuilding and renewal. Since COVID, something has happened. And as someone who gets to speak to people all over the world, the amount of stories I'm getting of little churches in rural Canada, of churches in places that people don't expect, people getting together on midweek and praying and worshipping, the Holy Spirit's turning up in services which don't have the Holy Spirit normally turn up. At our church, we've experienced this. We've had one of our services stopped where the Holy Spirit just took over. The Holy Spirit is coming in new ways which are sometimes quiet and intimate, but it's just clear that something is happening in the world. At this moment of change, and we are at a change between eras, we're at the beginning of a new kingship, not just for your country, but for my country as well. 
that actually there is something different in the world. And I think at this moment of renewal, we need to realize that the Holy Spirit doesn't want to just come and just give us good feelings. That happens at times. But actually what the Holy Spirit is coming to do is to actually build new pillars. What we don't need is a season where the Holy Spirit just comes and touches us and then it all evaporates and we look back in 2027 and go, oh, do you remember 2023 when we prayed and we felt something and it just washed away. What we actually need is a process of rebuilding, of renewing. We need actually a kind of renewal which actually changes us where we feel something, but our very lives are restructured and rebuilt into becoming pillars, which is a supportive structure of the next thing that God wants to build. You see, the temple doesn't get rebuilt properly. They attempt, as in this story, Herod, who has one foot, in worshipping Yahweh, but then this other foot in pleasing the Romans and worshipping other gods. He rebuilds the temple, but it's destroyed in 70 AD. Jesus prophesies that it will be destroyed. But what he says, and what the New Testament says, is that a new kind of temple is coming, and you're living in it now. And yes, we're in this room with actual pillars, but the story of the Scriptures point to a new kind of living temple in which you and I are called to be pillars supportive structures. And when we do this, the Spirit lives amongst us. I believe that for the last few years, God has been seeding something in some people's hearts to live differently. There are people in this place who have actually been doing things for God in the hidden places, and you've had this sense that no one has seen that, no one has heard that. But it's a deeper, deeper growth that goes deep into the earth. We are in a season that I believe God wants to build a new structure in his people, not just to rebuild the church, but we live in a time when so many things are falling down and God wants to rebuild and renew the culture through us, the church. As was mentioned at the beginning of this talk, I've had a really busy week of speaking. I got on a plane for 24 hours and I flew all the way to the UK, and it's been amazing. I've got to speak on some pretty amazing platforms. On Monday, I spoke at the Royal Abbott Hall to 6,500 people. Someone took a photo from the top and sent it to me, and it's like, I look like a dot. I never thought I'd speak in that place. Then, I will shared a stage the next day with the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, something I never thought I would do, and we had this conversation for an hour and a half. I had friends back in Melbourne who saw Nick Cave walking into the coronation with Rowan Williams, which was in all the Australian newspaper, and I was a lot blown away that I was like with him a couple of days earlier. On Thursday night, I got to speak in the pulpit of one of my heroes growing up, Martin Lloyd-Jones. These are not normal platforms when you're an Australian to speak in these places. But as I walked away from the event on Thursday night, having finished this incredible week of speaking in some incredible platforms, I got onto the platform of my station in the tube, and I got a call that you never want to get, which is from my wife back in Australia of the hectic, I didn't know what was happening, this was all news to me, but... My family had been in a hectic time for the last 72 hours previous. They hadn't let me know until they wanted to confirm what was going on. And as I stood on that, that platform, as my tube uh, train was approaching in about four minutes, my wife shared with me that she'd been diagnosed with breast cancer, completely out of the blue. She also shared that there was evidence that perhaps it had spread. I had to answer the, uh, end the phone because... My train was coming, and we were heading into the tunnel. And as I went around the loop, it felt like the floor was falling out from under me. And at that moment, and in really what's only been the 72 hours since then, I realized all of the platforms that I've spoken on really don't mean much. What has meant is the friend who caught a train in to sit with me for two hours in London. 
the friends at KXC Church who took time out of their afternoon to sit and pray with me so far away from home. The messages that I've had from all over the world, the people who brought my family meals at home. I think of the lady in our church who straight away, when she heard the news, organized a group of people to pray and fast for my family. I think of one text message I got. The word had gotten out, and a group of churches in Malaysia, churches I've never been to. There's like 10 names, I don't remember them all. I remember one was a church on one of the Malaysian islands, it was a Tamil church. And when I got that text, I just thought, this is incredible. You expect the people who are pillars in your life, but you don't expect people who are going to be pillars in other places in the world. I wrote this sermon before I heard the news on Thursday. But I'm living it now. I don't care about platforms. I just care about the pillars who have rallied around. Because when the bottom falls out, you need pillars. The world tells us to live this life which is just about us. But the kingdom of God is made with pillars. So, I don't know when in the next while I'll travel again to speak. This may be my last chance speaking for some time as now I have to head into a role of caring for my wife on this journey. But I really want my last invitation as I speak outside of my church to be to you to step into the invitation of what God is doing in this moment, to rebuild a life around being a pillar. It doesn't happen in a moment. It's a lifelong work. But there's a number of people, particularly those who perhaps see yourself as young. It's time to stop seeing yourself as young and seeing yourself as a pillar in the making. Thank you.